Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jimmy Smith, and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy YouTube channel for the WSET Level 3 course. Um, so this is a part of a number of series of presentations which are designed to help you in your studies and preparation for the Level 3 Theory Examination. This one is on Central Otago and also including Pinot Noir for the WSET Level 3. It also includes at the end a rather useful and wonderful working written question where we'll look at a label and we'll decipher it and we'll answer questions which are familiar to what WSET may ask you and we'll see how to structure answers. It's a really useful section, a really useful part to help you understand and prepare. Okay, so at the bottom of each slide are all of the social media handles. If you are that way inclined, you can get in touch via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and a like. Uh, wine with Jimmy is me on the left-hand side of the bottom there. My two wine schools, West London Wine School, South London Wine School in London, and then Streatham Wine House here also in London, my wine bar. Okay, so let's um, let's crack on with this. So we're gonna go and look at a bit of geography to begin with. Um, we'll then look at a Google Earth video, which is very short, and then we'll talk about Pinot Noir and then go through that uh, that question. Okay, okay, great, let's, uh, let's move on then. So here we are, first of all, here's a look at New Zealand. Um, some of you may have already looked at a couple of our other videos on New Zealand, certainly around Marlborough and Sauvignon Blanc. This time we are looking down in the southern tip of the South Island, and this is at Central Otago. Um, so New Zealand is split into two um, fairly large islands, the North Island and the South Island. Uh, it is then bordered up by the Tasman Sea on its, uh, on its uh, western side, and then on its eastern side by the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's a very long, thin stretch country, stretching from Auckland, quite humid Auckland at the top, and that's at about 35-ish uh, latitude south, and then all the way down towards central Otago and Dunedin uh, down here, which is around 45, 46 latitude south, and it's much cooler down here. In fact, a lot of um, uh, uh, trips, a lot of ships that sail for a week long all the way down to Antarctica leave from this bottom down here. So uh, you can kind of get a, a sense of its location by just learning that fact. Um, we've talked a lot on previous presentations about Sauvignon Blanc being the leading grape variety, but we're not going to do that on this one. On this one, we're going to look at Central Otago. So Central Otago is in that southern tip of the South Island. One thing that's not really identified on this map is something we should really scratch, uh, sketch in here. So really all the way down here, and then coming around here a little bit as well. This is what we call the Southern Alps. And the Southern Alps are a very important geological, uh, geographical feature because they do offer um, some rather good um, protection against the quite wet and uh, windy Tasman Sea, which can actually heavily affect the western side of New Zealand. So of course this will happen, but it is protected uh, or it protects rather the Southern Alps, as you can see here, as the rain will come through. It will protect regions that are on its eastern side, such as uh, Waiapara, um, Canterbury, but of course the one we're looking at, which is Central Otago. When I come to show you a video in a second, you'll get a bit of a feel for the Southern Alps. We'll actually join the Southern Alps um, kind of near Nelson and then move down. Our drone will move all the way down as it heads towards Central Otago. So Central Otago itself is a cool continental climate. Um, so it's, uh, it is continental. Now, uh, you know, it is an island. Uh, New Zealand's not a big landmass, but Central Otago is nestled into this kind of um, amphitheater U-shape within the, uh, within the, um, the Southern Alps, which creates a, a kind of a solid landmass for it. So it really does have very little effect from uh, any of the Tasman or Pacific uh, seas and oceans. So Central Otago, therefore, is a continental climate. Uh, it's also because of its location of latitude, which is 45 south, you are talking about being quite cool here. So it is, therefore, a cool continental climate. It does have some rather nice warm summers, um, but it has some very cold winters. 
The diurnal range, due to its continentality, is actually quite large. So you'll find that it has, uh, certainly in the growth season, summers and autumns will have quite warm summer days, and then it'll have those quite cold nights, and that's priceless for refreshing the vineyards and maintaining high acidities within the grapes. Um, so very good. It also has a huge amount of luminosity here. Um, the, the landscape here, New Zealand is islands in the middle of the Pacific, away from major urbanization, uh, and therefore it has um, some wonderful uh, clear skies and clear air. Uh, so as a result, really sunlight and the amount of sun that actually hits central Otago is rather intense, certainly combined with its latitude. Its long summer nights and its long autumnal nights mean that the ripening of the amount of luminosity here produces wonderfully ripe grapes and often quite high alcohols in the wine. Certainly with Pinot Noir, it's very common for the Pinot Noirs here to be 14% alcohol by volume. Now, as it's continental, there are weather problems which are associated to frosts. Um, and they are spring and autumnal frosts as well. So you'll find that um, there are definitely um, problems with yields when frosts are more prevalent. Uh, and this will damage buds, for instance, at the start of the year uh, and can damage the grapes at towards the end of the year. So spring and autumn frosts can be an issue in this area. Um, so this is Central Target. Now, I've included this map because I think it's interesting. However, you are not required to really know any detail about it. You just need to know that Central Otago is famous for Pinot Noir. So that's what I've identified here. Of course, at the top, Central Otago, and then I've popped down here in this red wine bottle, 70% of this region is dominated by Pinot Noir. There are other varieties. There's um, Chardonnay, which is very good here. There is Pinot Gris, which is decent here. And there is Riesling as well. But 70% is by far what they will focus on WSET as it is the major grape variety. Um, and the region kind of stretches uh, from Lake Wanaka at the top. There is Lake uh, Wakatipu down here, which is what Queenstown is found upon. Um, so two fairly large lake effects and then lots of smaller valleys uh, and streams and river valleys which empty into those lakes which will come from the Alps, the Southern Alps. Um, so that's the key thing. There are river and lake effects here um, and the different valleys with different exposures as well. It's not the highest in altitude because you're already looking at quite a cold climate. So it's about 200 to 450 meters of altitude, kind of the same, same as sort of Alsace in France. Um, and that's also classed as a cool continental climate. I've mentioned the high intensity of sunlight already. That is what ripens Pinot Noir to quite an extreme amount. Um, cool. Uh, so that is your um, your central Otago zone. Do not worry about the subregions, but you do have the smallest one at the top, which is on Lake Wanaka. Uh, so Wanaka, the subregion. You do have down here uh, Bendigo as well. Uh, you have, um, and then the Cromwell Basin. Bannockburn, probably the most famous, uh, the Alexandra Basin at the bottom. And then near Queenstown, you have Gibston Valley as well. Okay, you will not be required to know those, but uh, it does give you a bit of an idea. Okay, so Google Earth video here, just to give you a bit of a an idea about the 3D look of the area. And we're going to start this video by actually picking up the Southern Alps, but closer to the northern tip of the Southern Island. So there is New Zealand. Uh, so we are uh, just jumping to the right a little bit there, but and we're back. That's the lazy eye going on, I think. Um, we're going to head down towards, well, up, sorry, sorry, towards Marlborough first. You can see that's where we've actually sort of entered here. And now we are looking at that thin but long expanse of the Southern Alps, which kind of straddles the westerly side of New Zealand. Our wine regions, therefore, will be on the left of this, which is on the easterly side. OK, and then we're heading down. Um, you'll see some uh, wonderful lakes, which have been uh, glacial lakes, which have, uh, have been produced by these. And lots of them are in this kind of uh, northeast to south, sorry, northwest to southeast uh, formation, a lot of these lakes. Uh, so I think this is uh, Lake Wanaka. Um, 
But there are vineyards dotted around here, as you can see, um, not the biggest of region. But you'll see these, this kind of area, the whole of the central Otago area is nestled into the Southern Alps as kind of this gently risen plain. Um, you will get lots of river effect here and lots of lake effect for more ripeness. And then that elongation of warmth into its autumnal side of the season. And that's going to be mightily important for those frosts as well, which affect both spring and autumn. Uh, here's a, another um, view as well, one of the other valleys. Um, you'll see lots of vineyards located around, uh, around this one. Um, so very much nestled next to the lake for that cleared lake effect. And the same with a lot of the rivers around this area again. Uh, and a further look here um, as well at more vineyards. You, they're not come out. There we go. That's much better. But um, yes, located at the southern part of that uh, of that river, um, mightily important again, once again, for the for the warmth of this area. I think there might be one more to view here. I think it might be Ripon Vineyards. I can't quite remember. Let's have a look as it goes around. But great, great to get the idea of the landscape. Look at the southern Alps here, which form a very distinctive border and oh, it's some very uh, another sort of separate valley here again um i can't spot any vineyards at the minute here this just at this minute looks like pastoral landscape here um maybe some vineyards down at the bottom on that one but there you are that gives you an idea of how it looks uh for for the central otago zone so now we're going to talk about the key grape variety making 70% of plantations here, and that's Pinot Noir. Um, I will lend most of the descriptions here uh, for, for generally for Pinot Noir, but I will tend to go towards Pinot Noir in the area we're looking at at Central Otago. Um, so it, uh, you don't need to tend to need to know a huge amount of things like geology, but you will definitely need to know about generic concepts key concepts about Pinot Noir across the world. So first up in the vineyard Pinot Noir is that it prefers cooler conditions. Uh, it is a grape that originally comes from around Burgundy, of course, uh, and it's always grown up to sort of suit itself in these cooler conditions and at a, as an extreme, a moderate climate. Um, for us in central Otago, it is a cold continental climate, of course. The variety is early budding. Now, along with Aligote, Chardonnay, and all those varieties of the same part of the family tree, this is one issue that it does uh, tend to have. It is an early budder. That early budding means that there is issues with spring frosts, common, of course, in Burgundy, and there can be big issues there with that, as well as Champagne. Uh, but it's early ripening. So that ripening means that you know, you don't tend to need the lead on the vine longer. Uh, it means it can be grown in a relatively um, shorter or mid-term ripening season. And it has very thin skins. It's a very fickle, very challenging grape variety with these very thin skins. Um, that, of course, means it has less structure as a grape and less structure as a wine. So not much color, not much tannin. And a lot of the flavor, um, the flavor is quite aromatic, but not that depth uh, in depth. And that's due to those thinner skins as well. Pinot often needs a bit of help with winemaking to really promote its purity and its fruit character. So thin skins with Pinot Noir. It is a very fickle grape. It is very site sensitive, meaning that the different terroir that we find Pinot Noir on uh, will mean that it will be expressed very differently. Um, I think a great example here is to take two major soil types. And if you take a calcium rich soil type like limestone and variants of limestone like chalk, tufo, etc., um, this has huge calcium. Calcium is alkaline and in return in the wine, it produces very acidic uh, grapes and juice and therefore wines. And acidity is very linear, very direct and very bright in a wine which is grown on a calcium rich soils like limestone. The other type though, let's take a non sedimentary soil, let's take granite and that is uh, an igneous rock that's formed by um, underneath the earth molten magma formations and then they've been pushed out as mountains often or hills or hillsides. Um, the granitic soils 
uh, um, very low in calcium, but higher in potassium. And that actually um, bitartrates out during fermentation, making a much more rounder, softer acidity. You still find the acidity, it still makes your mouth water, but it's not that direct, it's a much smoother style. Um, and Pinot is so expressive, depending if it's schist and granite and limestone and clay, it can be quite forward. You know, there's lots of different geology, which then really produces very diverse Pinot Noir. So it's um, it's quite the key thing. You are not required to really go into much detail about the soils and geology of central Otago. So don't worry about that. It's mainly about areas like Burgundy that you will need to know about Pinot. Um, now, Pinot can yield a bit, um, but it is quite difficult to cultivate a big crop from Pinot Noir. It needs a lot of care and attention. Um, for instance, during the Black Death Plague, Pinot for 14 years was left alone because there was nobody to tend to it, and a lot of it struggled and died, whereas Gamay, a cousin of Pinot Noir, survived very well. It's very hardy and does okay as a wild vine, but Pinot doesn't. But um, even if you let it yield a bit, um, it can produce quite simple wines, and of course in areas where there are higher yields, in New Zealand, somewhere like Marlborough, you'll produce generally softer and lighter wines, a little bit like regional Bourgogne or Burgundy in France. If you limit the yields, and of course you work very hard in the vineyard um, to restrict the amount produced, um, you eliminate any problem fruit, uh, it can be often an, an uneven ripening variety, so you have to really be quite selective, then that's where you tend to get more concentration and intensity behind your Pinot Noirs. So very good with um, with restricted yields, and that's quite a, quite a good thing to say across many great varieties, in fact. Um, and I wanted to put this one in. It's not mentioned that much in your textbooks around Pinot Noir, but you do need to know some of these terminologies. Um, and these terminologies, I mean, susceptible, meaning that it can sadly suffer with these, and it's a fairly long list. So Pinot Noir, not only is it difficult to grow and it needs restrictive yields and it's site sensitive, it also can be damaged quite easily by a number of issues. Couleur, which is this one, the first one we've identified here on this list, um, so if you haven't heard that before, don't worry. Um, it is in your books. You will need to know it. Couleur is a shedding of the blossom. So this is during flowering. So if it's very windy or even rainy during the flowering and the blossom gets shed and it doesn't have time to uh, self-pollinate, then of course the yield will be restricted. Um, so that is shedding of the blossom, windy conditions during flowering. Downy mildew is produced uh, and, and promoted when there are kind of damp conditions, of course. Uh, and this can inhibit, inhibit photosynthesis and reduce yields. It can also create off flavors in the fruit. Botrytis is uh, a, a more benevolent form of rot, but concentrates sugars. Um, this can increase the sugar so much in Pinot that it can be overly alcoholic. So that often the fruit will have to be discarded. And also virus diseases. Now you're not required to know much about them. There is one called fan leaf, which apparently Pinot is quite susceptible to, to, to as well. Fan leaf is a bit more infamous, I suppose, down uh, in the Cape Colony, uh, the Western Cape, South Africa. In the winery, so Pinot Noir, they like to ask questions on because so much can happen with it. Um, Pinot is not the most expressive grape variety. It's got some good aromatics, but it often needs a helping hand to get the best expression out of it. So as Pinot comes into the winery, it may be crushed, but before fermentation, it may be stored at cold temperatures. Um, this can be anything up to around 10 degrees C. Um, fermentations might start to kick in, um, but it's unlikely. Um, but often very low temperatures mean that you are just literally storing the juice in contact with its skins and pips. And very gentle flavor and color is, um, is seeped out at this time. And this is called cold soaking or cold maceration. This is very, very uh, common across Pinot Noir in the world. Um, now, some Pinot Noir producers choose to do the typical uh, red wine production technique, that is to de-stem it all uh, and then crush it and then to ferment it as normal. Um, this will um, produce 
you know, a decent Pinot Noir, probably depends on the quality of the fruit, but it's a typical production method, destemming and crushing. Others will tend to use some potentially whole bunches of, of, of fruit in there. So with some uh, grapes um, thrown in, there might be a certain percentage of whole bunches that are still intact with their stems. Now, at this stage, um, this is uh, more important as what will happen is those fermentations, those berries, those in they're intact, remember, they're not crushed. The rest of the grapes are crushed, but the ones that are still on the stems are intact. They get mixed in to the vat and then under the pressure, which the rest of the grapes are then fermenting, those grapes will go through an intracellular transformation like you'd find in a Beaujolais. Um, this means um, it draws out a lot of bright character, a lot of fruitiness and freshness comes out like you would get in a Beaujolais, for instance. So some people choose to do this whole bunch fermentations, 5, 10, 50, 100 percent sometimes. Uh, it depends on what you are after as a style. There are some that um, that focus on semi-carbonic variations as well. Uh, so this may be whole um, vats full of stemmed grapes, you know, you're still intact with their stems, and go through the semi-carbonic method um, with a partial yeast fermentation and, uh, and then a semi-carbonic maceration on those stems. Um, what Pinot Noir will, if it does go through this, will tend to go through after, is then contact on its skins after with the fermentation as it finishes off. Whereas Beaujolais won't tend to go through much of that. And that will give it a bit more character and a bit more intensity. So semi-carbonic variations can happen as well. Generally, generally for the more sort of brighter stars, some premium ones will do it as well though. Careful cap management. Um, now, you, one thing you know is that the skins are very thin. But the wine of a Pinot tends to be on the lighter side of its body. Over extraction of tannin and of colour um, will actually create an unbalance in the wine. So working the cap and keeping it moist is always important, but also um, sort of moderating strategically the amount of remontage or pigeage, which may happen with the cap management. It has to be done very carefully. Temperature of fermentations. Um, so um, you can find fermentations that are high up at 30 degrees Celsius um, for Pinot Noir, and that will extract a fair whack of the color and tannin and riper characteristics. Um, but many tend to opt for slightly lower temperature fermentations um, over a longer period to really be able to control fully what is extracted. Uh, so temperature variations do exist for Pinot Noir fermentations. Uh, and then um, oxidative uh, methods. So both through fermentation in oak and maturation in oak as well, Pinot Noir has to be carefully thought about because it is not the world's biggest style of wine. So the oak that is used is often second or third or fourth fill and even neutral. Uh, and that is really just to control oxidation, but not really impart much flavor profile. So you'll find across a lot of key producers in the world, um, old oak barrels is being used. In central Otago, you do find some newer oak being used as the alcohols are quite robust. The wines are a bit bigger in body. So new oak does suit them quite well. So you will find that in fact. And the style of Pinot Noir, of course, acidities tend to be high. In central Otago, they're kind of medium to high. Um, alcohols tend to be um, sort of low to medium in uh, central Otago, they're medium to high and the body can be anywhere from light to full, but they tend to be light to medium in central Otago, medium to full, they tend to be a bit bigger. You're seeing a bit of a trend here. Um, the characteristics we expect tend to be very much red cherry, um, a raspberry and uh, strawberry characteristics. Any of those could also be in a liqueur type format, certainly from places like Central Otago. So the cherry could be more like a Kirsch, the raspberry could be more like a Chambord, and you'll find that kind of more con concentrated liqueur edge to it. Um, they tend to be a bit more spicier, I think, really, from uh, Central Otago. Um, there's less inherent terroir characteristics that I find in Central Otago in comparison to Burgundy, but those those inhibitions are changing. Mushroom, earthy, game, savory, vegetal, all tends to happen, of course, with age. Um, I, t I tend to find the Central Otago's go quite leathery. Um, they don't tend to go as earthy, mushroomy as Burgundy's, but of course that is also changing.
So let's just go through a few written questions together so you get an idea of what could be asked and how to answer them. State and describe. So we have a label here. They quite like label questions, WSET. Here is Sam Neill. Sam Neill of uh, Event Horizon, Jurassic Park fame. This is his two paddocks, the Fusilier. Bannockburn Vineyard, one of the key sub-regions, Pinot Noir. State and describe the climate of this wine. You don't need to know about the specific sub-regions. You just need to talk about Central Otago being a cool continental. That's two marks with warm summers, cold winters. That's another mark. And a large diurnal range. That's the uh, difference between the night and day. That will get you your final mark. That's really all WSET gives you in your textbooks. What is the major, major weather hazard? These, of course, are frosts across spring and autumn. Um, it's always useful to then sort of discuss um, ways of combating spring frost. Um, <clears throat> there are four, I think, major methods we can talk about through WSET. First of all, careful planning of the vineyard. So on areas which are less um, spring prone, so areas like steep slopes um, and south facing slopes. Um, and then the other three are um, things around sprinkling of water, um, heat sources like chaufferettes or bougies or smudge pots, uh, and then finally air circulation. And that's all covered in um, other presentations, but uh, it's always useful to look at that and understand that uh, as a part of the theory. Often Pinot Noir from this wine's region are high in alcohol. What factors in the vineyard account for this? Just two marks. The intensity of sunlight here due to the long summer and autumnal days create riper grapes with higher alcohols. Um, so that is really about its luminosity. It's a very sunny place, very clear air. Um, remember, New Zealand only has about three and a half million people and it's about the same land mass as Great Britain. Uh, so therefore, um, you know, a lot less space, uh, so much more space, less people, um, and I think less pollution, of course, uh, lots of sheep. Um, 11 to 1, I, I heard from a student the other day. Some winemakers desire to increase the brightness and fresh primary red fruit of Pinot Noir. State and describe two ways how this would be achieved in the winery. First of all, pre-fermentation techniques such as cold maceration, cold soaking at low temperatures extract bright colour and flavour. Um, we talked about that earlier. Whole bunches with crushed fruit to use. The whole bunches will go through a carbonic maceration within the crushed fruit, producing more brighter red fruit flavours. Now, that's just two I've given you, which are quite famous too, but there are others you could really think about here as well. Um, so let's just have a quick think about those. Um, you could talk about semi-carbonic maceration uh, with continued fermentation on skins, as we mentioned earlier. Now, I talked about that already. If you still, and many students struggle to get their heads around these very intricate winemaking techniques, please do have a good read of this section. Let me just find out exactly where it is in your textbooks again. Uh, so you will be, here we go. So page 64 in your green textbook is very useful for uh, understanding that. And please keep rereading through it so it gets into your sponge-like brain. Um, so semi-carbonic ma maceration with continued um, skin contact, fermentation on skins. And really, I think one that many of you may have thought about is avoiding oxidation. You have to be quite careful of this because Pinot Noir often actually gets enhanced by a bit of oxidation. But it is sensible and careful to put down that um, too much oxidation will diminish the primary fruit. And that's what it's talking about in the question here. It will enhance more secondary and tertiary characters. Um, but I will be a little bit careful. Um, I can't speak for the WSET examiners, but <clears throat> what I would find is a, a, a good little amount of controlled oxidation, which is very common on Pinot Noir, will help promote more character and, and push out the red fruit character. So I would urge you to think about these two that I've put down and potentially semi-carbonic maceration. There are others as well, but uh, I'm trying to get these really into your mind more than anything. Fantastic. So thank you so much for viewing this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting and useful for your impending judgment day of the WSET Level 3 examination. 
Um, we have lots more of this kind of stuff on the Wine with Jimmy e-learning portal. Go to winewithjimmy.com for more information. It's a subscription service that you will need to pay for for level three, but you get a brilliant amount of more videos, member-only content, plus you'll get stuff like um, written uh, written questions and answers, huge bank, a data bank of multiple choice questions, as well as flashcards and other things. And we're always on hand, on hand to help out with those things as well. If you have any comments or questions about this video or anything else, please get in touch uh, in the description and the comments bo box below this video, or get in touch via the social media channels here of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and so on, at Wine with Jimmy, West London Wine, South London Wine, Stratton Winehouse, the two schools and the bar. Next time you're in London, come and see us for a class, a glass or a bottle. Cheers. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you.